Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here, of course, with some more geography now. Uh, surname? I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this. Uh, geography now just dropped this country. It was yesterday. Uh, so I'm jumping right on it. When a new country comes out, you know, I, I do it. <laughs> <laughs> right that's my thing uh and so we're done every country in the world uh but yeah if you're new here definitely check out all the previous countries i'm do i do it in alphabetical order and so i've pretty much done most of the countries and i've done some regions and stuff like that so definitely check out that playlist I also do a lot of war videos and stuff like that so definitely check out the playlist a lot of cool stuff there and yeah let's jump into this video please hit that like and subscribe and below it helps me out a lot and yeah I just got off work, so I'm, like, psyching myself up by, like, you know, because I was, like, I like, oh, my God, I'm tired, but I want to do a video. So, like, get myself pumped up before I start this video, right? Anyways, guys, uh, yeah, like and subscribe and all that good stuff, and, yeah. Three, two, one, bam. All right, Suriname. So, South Suriname. America has everything you can imagine. It has everything from penguins to wrestling cholitas. Penguins. But then you go up to the north and you find the three Guiana triplets. They are so hidden, secluded, and often forgotten. Basically, you take a ton of Asians, Africans, and put them in a new continent, and after 400 years, they somehow end up speaking Dutch. And there's a ton of Hindus. Welcome to Suriname. What? Well, let me make sure my volume is all the way up here. Okay, never stop. I was wondering why I was so loud. It's time to learn geography. Now! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. Get some Geography Now merch at geographynow.com. It's not selling out if it's your brand. So just a little disclaimer, I actually talked to many of you guys, the Surinamese geography peeps, and I was planning to visit Suriname for this episode, but literally all the flights were completely booked at the time of writing this script. All land borders were closed off to non-essential travelers. I even tried looking at like crossing the border from Guyana or like the Dutch Caribbean, like flying from Aruba, nothing. In any case, the show must I, I love how Paul's dedicated, because Paul's been to like, a lot of countries, man. The dude's dedicated. I, I'm jealous, because I wish I could do the same thing he does. Uh, but it doesn't surprise me at all. Just traveling in general right now, it, it's a hard thing to do, you know. Especially, you pay us to pay on what countries you go to. But either way, there's a lot of, like, holes you got to go through just to, you know, just to make it happen. But anyways, yeah. Must go on. I'm still going to feature some of you guys in this episode with sent in video footage. It's time to start off, so let's go to the globe. So Suriname is kind of like one of those, whoa, how did that even happen countries? It all begins in South America. So here's the globe. First of all, Suriname is located in the northern section of the South American continent, bordered by Guyana to the west, Brazil to the south, and the overseas territory of French Guiana to the east. To the north lies the Atlantic Ocean. These three, in addition to the eastern part of Venezuela and the Amapa state of Brazil, are sometimes referred to as the Guianas, Spanish, English, Dutch, French, and Portuguese. The country is divided into 10 districts. Most are all concentrated along the coast, where most of the people live. Live. And this big one, mm -hmm. Sipaliwini, is just like, okay, whatever, we'll just cover all the rest of the unknown jungle stuff. It doesn't even have its own administrative capital like the others. Suriname also has two disputed areas in the south with Guyana and French Guiana. The one with Guyana at the headwaters of the Quarantine River to the west. And with French Guiana, it lies on the headwaters of the Litani River to the east. If you don't include these disputed areas, it would make Suriname the smallest country in South America. The capital, Paramaribo, yes. lies on the coast and holds about half of the entire country's wow. population. Paramaribo is basically the hub where all roads connect to in the country. The furthest you can go inland on paved road would be the small town of Pokihron in the Suriname River on the Martin Luther King Highway. Otherwise, the JFK Highway is the longest one that traverses the inland areas all the way to the Quarantine River on the border with Guyana. There are definitely curious as I get, I mean, it'll tell me like, like you know, the, the highways are, you know, basically, you know, like named after Americans as kind of curious when I mean, it's in South America, I guess, you know, the influence, uh, I don't know. It, it kind of caught me off guard there. There are currently no bridges connecting them to Guyana or French Guiana, and all land vehicles wishing to cross must take ferries. Currently, there is also no road access to Brazil in the south. From there, most of the remaining communities inland are only accessible via boat transportation on various rivers that intertwine the complex, thick forests of the interior. The largest and busiest airport where most international travel arrives would be Johann Adolf Pengel International Airport, servicing Parimaribo, the capital, of course, even though it's located about 28 miles or 45 kilometers south of Parimaribo. If you want to arrive 
arrive more central to the city, you can take a plane from Guyana on Trans Guyana Airways to the only other international airport, Sogonhop International, which is right in the middle of the wow. city, and it can only accommodate smaller aircrafts holding up to 20 passengers max. Otherwise, the country actually has... And that'd be pretty scary, though, man. If you're like one of those houses on the edge there, it'd also be pretty cool. I, mean, I could sit there probably all day and just watch sit on my front porch and watch airplanes land all day, man. But like at nighttime, you're laying down and go to bed, like just hearing that plane. Like, I don't know. For me, like, I'd be like, is it tonight the night where one crashes into my house? I don't know. It's definitely interesting and cool how compact that is, though. It has over 50 smaller regional airports and airstrips, mostly unpaved airstrips across the country. The majority, at about three quarters of all airstrips, being located in wow. the difficult to access, mostly native communities of the Sipaliwini district. The southernmost airstrip of the country being in the appropriately named community of Silawipini. Fun fact, Suriname is the only country in South America that doesn't border a Spanish-speaking country. So anyway, getting around in Suriname is not the easiest task. Everything is either a road or a river, and they are considering building a rail line between Parimaribo and Om Good. That means unexpected? Yep, they also have towns named Waterland and Boom Yaklust. The real funny thing is, how did Suriname even become a country? See, back in the 1600s somethings, the UK and Netherlands were pissed at each other, which led to the Second Dutch Anglo War. It was basically like, Stop taking all the bloody trade routes, you greedy s No. <laughs> which led to the Treaty of Breda, which was like, Okay, so we won. We're gonna take your rich, fertile sugar plantations in the Guiana Belt and call it Dutch Guiana. And you can keep that small, whatever, cold, depressing new Amsterdam colony in the north. What on earth? Oh no, whatever will I do with it? <laughs> in any case, Suriname has a lot of amazing sights to see. Here's Jagerpeep Sheldon from Suriname to explain. Hi there, Fawaka. The top places to visit and see in Suriname are the historical inner city of Paramaribo. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The most famous places in this area are Porcelandia, a museum, and Suriname's first building, the Wadena, huh. and the Independence Square, or as we say in Dutch, Head on a Pankelekes plane, the Palmatang or Palm Tree Garden, and the Wakapasi Boulevard. Located outside the historical part are the Central Market, the Reditex Art Gallery, and the different cultural markets, Old Dutch Plantations. For New Amsterdam, the Pepper Pot Nature Park, we have the Biggie Pan Lake. The dark water creeks and white sand savannas are where we locals go to relax. Other nice. top places in the jungle of Suriname are the Bronze Bed of Nature Park, the Vaults Bed of the Blanchimari Falls, and the many sulas or rapids where you can lay in and relax because they are usually located next to an eco resort. Thank you, Sheldon. Wow. So much going on in Suriname, especially in the nature side, and they are. Yeah, I was saying like, damn, that seems like a nice, relaxing, cool place to take a vacation. You know. I know I say that a lot, but I wasn't really, you know, Suriname's, you know, obviously one of those, I, I, I'll be honest, never, never, never even heard of this country. I'm sorry. Uh, but like, it definitely seems like a very kind of chill country, but I wasn't really expecting there to be like a lot maybe to do and do there, but that, that seems like a lot of, you know, some cool stuff to do. I don't know literally the most carbon negative country on earth but that's for the next segment so let's move on yeah you are skip, skip. 100% <laughs> Uh, Suriname is literally the most forested country on earth. Multiple sources have different numbers on the exact percentages but I averaged them out to somewhere wow. above 95% the highest dang is uh, I get but I mean like if you're like someone that lives there, could you like, you say you have some money, can you go like buy like the forested area and like cut it down and make yourself a nice house there? Kind of thing is, I don't know. I'm sure there's already probably land that's not forested that's probably empty anyway that you could probably buy anyways, right? I don't know. I don't know, just came to mind. The estimate I got was actually over 98%. I mean, if you look at Suriname from above, it's literally almost entirely green. And we shall see it from above in the motion graphic. Suriname Ooh. is located in the Guyana Shield, a historically coveted region of South America, with not only some of the most fertile land, but some of the highest biodiversity in the world. The shield is known as a craton, one of the oldest and most stable sections of Earth's crust, unaffected by fault lines, as it is centrally located within the South American plate. Which means, of course, they don't get any earthquakes or tsunamis. Whoop-de-doo. The further inland you go <laughs> within this shield, 
field, and specifically in Suriname, the land slightly rises to three main mountain chains, the Bakhaus Mountains, the Tumukumak Mountains, and the Wilhelmina in the center, where you can find the tallest peak, Yuliana Top, at about 1,200 meters high. From these highlands, the longest river fully within the country, the Suriname River, flows north to the Atlantic, but not before flowing into the largest inland body of water that takes up about 1% of the entire country's landmass, the Brokopondo Reservoir. This reservoir was a byproduct of the Afobaka Dam on the north side, the largest in the country built in the 60s and reached its full flooded level in 1971. The reservoir only has an average about 13 meters in depth, which means the more elevated sections of the lake area created hundreds of shallow reservoir islands. The whole country Mm. runs on rivers, though, and flanked on the sides of the Suriname River are the Tapanahani in the east, the Kopanam to the west, and on the borders, the Moroni and the Quarantine, the longest shared river of the country with Guyana. These are the five powerhouse rivers of Suriname. The only section of Suriname that seems to have a stark contrast to the otherwise overbearing green forest format would be the Sipaliwini Savannah Nature Reserve in the south, where the landscape suddenly turns into a somewhat arid grassy hill domain, seldom explored, and continues into Brazil's Tumucumaque Mountains National Park. Now, you would think, with lots of trees and forests, Suriname would be loaded with cropland. Well, not really. See, only about 1% of the land is arable, and only about half of that 1% is cultivated. Yeah, just because you got a lot of trees doesn't mean you have to have a lot of farms. Also, random fact. There was this one time where this helicopter flew into the forest, but it crashed, and they actually never found the helicopter again because the forest is so super dense. The moment you get lost, you will probably never be found again. In terms of land exploitation, though, (laughs) Suriname actually prefers to take the mineral route instead of the agricultural one. To this day, aluminum in the form of bauxite and gold are the largest export products of Suriname. Otherwise, Suriname has one more trick up their sleeves. They have been able to successfully extract oil from their offshore deposits, all produced by the state-owned company Statsuli. I think I pronounced that right. I don't know. Also, random fact, there are currently no patent laws in Suriname. So if you are in Suriname, try not to be all like... I just had such a great idea, but I can't patent it. Any hua? One thing Suriname doesn't have to patent are their unique endemic animal species. And with that, here's Gary Harlow to explain. Gary, Gary Harlow here. He's uh, got a hat as the most forested nation on earth. Obviously, you're gonna get an influx of wildlife. Today, there are nearly 200 mammal species, nearly 300 reptiles and amphibians, over 700 birds, like the national animal, the lesser kiskadee. Nice. The country is 16 protected areas and reserves taking up about an eighth of the entire country's land. Nice. Many new species are being discovered by scientists every year, like the blue poison dark frog in the South Sipaliwini Nature Reserve. And speaking of amphibians, we can't let you get away from an episode about Surinam without talking about the Surinam toad. Viewer discretion advised. Right. This flight bastard has one of Mother Nature's most... <laughs> <laughs> My script writing. <laughs> this flat bastard has one of Mother Nature's most strangest ways of being a mother in nature. The toads lay their eggs on their backs, which then fuse in with mother's skin. And from there, the eggs hatch and the fully formed babies pop out like bursting pimples from mommy's spine, <laughs> leaving a pockety scarred backside resembling a honeycomb from hell. And speaking of... It looks like it got like run over by a car how flat that thing was. Dang, dude, like... I mean, I don't know how he eats anything. <laughs> Babies, I got one of my own. Here's a photo to prove it. It's real. Mini <laughs> Harlow. He's a dad. He's, He's a, a dad. dad. He's a dad. He's a dad. Thank you, Gary, and congrats on your offspring. Suriname's culture is similar to that of the Caribbean, in which most people have gardens in their homes where they have access to tropical fruits and produce. And with that, why don't we let uh, Surinamese geography Lakeisha explain a little bit more about the food. Take it away. So Suriname is a huge melting pot of different cuisines from all over the world. A dish, however, that we do find regularly in almost every single household is brown beans and rice. Some other notable dishes include peprewatra, which is a spicy soup, cassava bread, which is traditional to the Maroons, and herheri. These are often served with surhut, which is pickled vegetables. Some snacks include bara, uh, a savory fried Indian snack, boyo, a cassava and coconut cake, kixi, mm. which is a rum spice cake, and mycena cookies, mm. which are cornstarch cookies with sprinkles on top. Uh, drinks include dawit, 
which is a rose chendol drink, kasiri, made from cassava by the Amerindians in Suriname, and mariam birchrum, which is a Surinamese rum, which can be up to 90%, nice. which is crazy. I want some of that rum. See, I'm a rum person. I love drinking rum and coke. Uh, so yeah, send me a bottle of that stuff. That's awesome. I really got to go now. Thanks, Nikisha. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, and remember on Fan Friday, Geography Mathis sent me this stuff, Surinamese egg cake mix. I literally saved it for this episode, and I'm going to make it right now. It makes some cake? Hmm. I'm hungry. I got cookies here. I can't eat lots of this. <laughs> Ah, mm. oh, good food, good people. All right, well, anyway, let's move on to the next segment. Sometimes when I see people eat food like that, like, I wonder if they actually truly like it because I do uh, reactions to Universal Yum. Like, I've done, like, you know, South Korea, I've done Greece. Yeah, you know, I, I just did Taiwan last week. And you can definitely tell my reaction to eating that stuff. I didn't like most of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. It, uh you can tell by my reaction. So sometimes I wonder, you know, people are like, yeah, this is great. And then the camera goes off and they're like, Bleh! but it actually looked really good though. The people of Suriname. Go! <laughs> All right, you guys know this is my favorite part of the episode. Not going to lie. In Suriname, you might occasionally hear the phrase Enheid and Verscheidenheid. Sorry, my Dutch is terrible. Like their neighbor Guyana, the entire country is essentially a hodgepodge of ethnic communities which have their own distinct backstories. Okay. We'll get into that in a second, but first, the graph. The country of Suriname has almost about 600,000 people and is the least populated country in South America. From there, the societal breakup gets a little interesting. The largest groups of people are the Afro-Surinamese, making up about 38% of the nation. However, within this group, there are two divisions, the Maroons at about 22% and the Creoles at about 16%. From there, the next largest community would be the Indo-Surinamese, taking up somewhere around 27% of the population, followed by the Javan Surinamese at about 14%. Amerindian natives make up about 4%. After that, the Chinese make up about 2%. Europeans hmm. at about 1%. And the remainder of the population is made up mostly of multiracial or other groups around the world, including the Lebanese, mostly Maronite, and even a small but surviving population of about 200 Jews. They use the Surinamese dollar as their currency. They use the types C and F plug outlets. And with Guyana, they are one of the only two countries in South America that drive on the left side of the road. Left side? That will never be a thing. Anyway, so as you can tell, Suriname is very mixed and we have a lot to break down. First, the language. Dutch is the sole official language of the country as it was a former Dutch colony. And in addition, the vast majority of the population also speaks Srananthongo, which is an English-based Creole. It is the most widely used lingua franca amongst all the communities and it is used interchangeably with Dutch in daily life. Even the national anthem is shared, half Dutch, half Srananthongo. And then it gets even more complicated because because there are about 14 locally recognized languages used amongst wow. the various ethnic groups. You go to Suriname, you'll see a lot of code switching. On top of that, much of the country can communicate in English as well. Many learn nice. it as a third language. So how did all of this manifest? Well, I don't long know. story short, and actually it's not going to be a long story short. Oh, I hope you can pay attention to all this. Let's start with the Afro-Surinamese. Why are they divided into two? Well, basically during the Atlantic slave trade years, many Africans were brought over to Suriname. Within that time, many of them escaped the plantations that they were forced to work on into the rainforest. And through ethnogenesis, that's when a new ethnic group is created, they created their own tribes and societies. These people are wow. known as the Maroons. The most fascinating thing is that even after four centuries, their languages still maintain intelligible roots to West African origins. There's actually a documentary called Suriname Meets Ghana, in which a Ghanaian man visits a Maroon village in Suriname and is able to communicate with them using the Akan language. It's quite trippy, check it out. On that note, the Creoles are just descended from the ones that didn't escape or the ones that mixed with Europeans and had biracial children. This community became more Dutchified and they developed their own community completely different from the Maroons despite both being considered black. Fast forward to the late 1800s, slavery was abolished which meant that the Dutch brought in indentured servants from Indonesia and India and a bit from China as well. And speaking of which it's fourth, the Chinese community is kind of divided into old school versus fobs. Basically they came in three separate waves. A lot of quotes. The original brought in from the 1800s and the 1940s, mostly Hakka and Cantonese in origin. Then the third wave of 
Chinese immigrants came in in the 90s and so on, mostly Mandarin speaking. This group within the Chinese community is not as rooted as the old school class. Oh, and the Jews, of course, we almost forgot them. Suriname actually has the first Jewish settlement in the Americas. Brought over by the British wow. at Marshall Creek Settlement in 1639. Over the years and after the war times, most of them left and today there are less than 200 people that claim Judaism as their religion in most recent censuses. Censuses, censusai, censai, whatever the plural is. Nonetheless, the legacy lives on and today you can even see the Jewish temple in Parimaribo peacefully next to the mosque. They even share the same parking lot. On that note, religion. Christianity is the largest religion adhered to from people of all communities at just under half the country at about 48%. After that, the second largest religion, mostly held by the indo surinamese is Hinduism. Islam, mostly from the Javanese community, makes up about 13%, and the rest are other beliefs, mostly indigenous or unaffiliated. Now, there's a line in the national anthem that kind of signifies the social dynamic of Suriname. Wherever our ancestors come from, we are the ones that have to build and improve Suriname. It wasn't always peaches and cream getting to that point, though. Peaches and cream, I never say that. What the f Anyway, the point, it wasn't always easy. After independence, things got a little messy, and it all centered around a weird political dance between these two people, Desi Baltersé and Ronnie Brunswick. Baltersé led a military coup that took over the country in 1980, and then it was like, hey Desi man, uh, I've been your bodyguard for like, uh, since the beginning, can I get a raise? No! Um, well, can we at least talk about the rights of the Maroons, you know, my people? No! Okay, well then I hate you now. <laughs> this led to Baltersé committing massacres and Brunswick hijacking the Afobaka Dam and threatening to flood Pari Maribo if Baltersé refused to negotiate. During this time, many people fled Suriname, mostly migrating to the Netherlands or the Dutch Caribbean. Long story short, after the war settled, things cooled off, but then in 2010, it was like, hey, Brunswick, somehow I managed to make the largest political party in Suriname, but I only have 23 seats in parliament and I need 26 or more. I, I know we hated each other in the 80s, but how about we get past that and cooperate? Because this time with your seven seats, you know. Although this may seem weird on the surface to some of the viewers because there's a lot of contextual backstory from the past two decades that led up to this moment that we don't have time to explain. I'll just say, yes, we, let's cooperate. And that's how miraculously <laughs> Baltersay became president again, twice, even though he had massacre conviction convictions and an ongoing drug trafficking scandal with an over 20 year sentence from Europol should he ever step foot in Europe to enact an arrest warrant. Nonetheless, President wow. Suriname's politics. In any case, that's a lot of info to digest, so let's move yeah. forward. Despite all the confusing political upheaval, the people of Suriname still generally respect and coexist amongst each other pretty well. And one thing that definitely unites them is sports. Usually Art fills in for this part, for the sports part, but he's uh, on vacation with his family. Why not? You left your dog here, man. Fun fact, this guy once took a massive diarrhea on Keith. True fact. <laughs> so how about we just have our favorite Serbian come on in, Ivan. You remember him. The go-to. You're gonna have to be, uh... Oh, okay. We're, we're doing... That. You're gonna have to be art today. What do you think? All right, take care. Does that work? What do you think? Do I look like you're dead? Hmm? So in Suriname, <laughs> recreation is, of course, a big part of life. Everyone in Suriname will hail swimmer Anthony Nesti. Well, Suriname's first ever and so far only Olympic medalist, he was also the first black swimmer to ever win a gold medal at the Olympics and he even yeah. went on to coach the U.S. Olympic swim team at the Tokyo Olympics. I mean, this guy's freaking amazing. Otherwise, the Surinamese will also probably mention track and field star Letitia Frizde, winner in multiple regional competitions like Central American and Caribbean Games, and even a silver in the World Championships. She is also the first, and to this day, the only sports person from Suriname to compete at five Olympics. For the number one sport, though, all Surinamese will probably agree. Soccer. Or we'll say football. The funny thing is many players of Surinamese origin, like these guys, do really well. For the Netherlands, during conflict years, many of their parents immigrated, and yeah. The interesting thing, though, is that for the longest time, Suriname was strict and would not allow Dutch athletes to compete for Suriname, regardless of their background. Rude. Wow. That rule has just changed, though. As of 2019, the Suriname Football Association would allow sports passports for Dutch citizens of Surinamese descent Good to deal. play on their national team and represent Suriname. And they are definitely seeing results, folks. But anyway, those are probably the biggest sports highlights. And with that, we bring it back to you, Barbs. Thank you, Yvonne. I mean, they also kind of do a little bit of cricket. They just joined the International Cricket Committee in 2002, but it was just kind of like, you know, hey, Guyana and the rest of the Caribbean are doing it, so I should too. Their team's not that good. <laughs> Moving on! Suriname, as you can see, is loaded with a colorful society and people. To explain a little bit more on the Surinamese culture, here's Hannah with Random Hannah's Culture Segment. Mm -hmm. Attack! They knew we were coming. You posted current move, about to attack Wall Street. <laughs> 
sir and am, I am here. Yes, sir, I am. Get it, it's a pun. <laughs> so with Suriname, each of the major communities has their own set of unique traditions and customs. For example, maroon societies are divided into lows or clans, and bees or lineages, each based on matrilineal ancestors. At the head of the maroon community sits the chief or grandman or gama. He is appointed for life by his people and further recognized and sworn in by the Surinamese government. Indo-Surinamese people are kind of like a pan-North Indian fusion community and their language is still intelligible to many Indians in India today. Even the current president, an Indo-Surinamese, took his oath on the Vedas while speaking ancient Sanskrit. They celebrate typical Hindu festivals that everyone gets involved in, Indian or not. The Javan Surinamese community is probably the best at maintaining their mother tongue. The sad thing though is that today the language is dying. In the 70s, Suriname lost somewhere around 20 to 25,000 Javan people that migrated to the Netherlands, which was a significant portion of the community. Today, about two-thirds of them are Muslim, making it the highest percentage of Muslims per country in all the Americas. And of course, the native indigenous Surinamese community is very noticeable. There are eight tribes, the largest being the Kalina and Lokono. They are basically cousins of the Arawak and Carib peoples. We discussed about these people in past episodes. You know, the ones that migrated to the Caribbean islands. Those guys. A lot of these people still practice traditional customs. For example, the Kalina take funerals very seriously with a ritual called epiketono. There's body paint, music, and they yeah. burn the deceased belongings. Some of the Lakono people have rite of passage customs for boys and girls, and tobacco is considered a sacred plant. Never smoked for recreational purposes, but for prayers. And speaking of festivals, the country has lots of them that everyone participates in. You have the Biggie Biggie Brokey Waka, the AVD Festival, Keti Koti, or Abolition of Slavery Day, Independence Day, and the largest one of the year probably being the New Year's Eve. Oh, and uh, speaking of arts and festivals, Suriname actually only has one cinema in all the country. If you want to learn more about Suriname's film industry, go watch the Filmography Now episode. I started a spin-off channel. Canada has a spin-off. We do this every time. Hey, and with that... In South America, has, apparently has a lot of awesome, like... Oh my god, festivals, yeah, that's it. Uh, because every time I see a kind like do a new country in South America, like the festivals are, are awesome, big, and well, this look exciting, anyways. We have, we have no, no choice, choice but to go. Are you sure, Paul? We have no choice. It's coming. <sighs> Key segment, here you go, people. He actually lives here now. No, he, no, he doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually right. I live here in this hood. By the way, I love Emperor. They're a great band. Uh, this is my commentary. Don't sue. Anyway, music in Suriname. Basically, the four largest ethnicities have their own musical genres. For the Creoles, you have Kawina, Kaseko, and Kabola. Within these styles, there's lots of cool vocals and percussion. For the indo surinamese they like to play chutney, even though it originated in Trinidad, and Baitak Ghana. It's like a Caribbean Indian fusion genre with keyboards and the dolok drum. For the Javanese okay. community, pop java is very popular. Shocker. And if you're lucky, you'll see a gamelan orchestra. Oh? And finally, the Maroons. They prefer a more traditional tribal style of music, almost exclusively using percussion as the sole instrument. They have styles okay. from Awasa, which is like a fast footwork dancing style, to Siketi, which is a female harmonized vocal style with tons of clap. Fun fact, every two years there is a huge popular music festival called Surrey Pop. It's basically a competition in which the winner is the composer and not the singer, which I actually think is correct. It is broadcast nationwide and the winner gets a trophy and or a cash money Rise. Over the years, so many popular artists or groups, either from Suriname or Surinamese, have popped up like these guys. Comment below and let us know what you think. Anyways, my name's Keith. That's it for me. I love y'all. Goodbye. Woo! Thank you, Keith. So there's so much to Suriname. You got the music, the culture, the people. So the only question left is, who does Suriname hang out with? Let's find out in... 
the Friends of Suriname. Now, the country is quite diverse, but how does that diversity play into the way how they interact with the rest of the diverse world? For one, Suriname is actually heavily tied in with Switzerland and Liechtenstein, as they are both top exporters in Europe, especially in the gold sector. France has an embassy in Suriname and has been cooperating with Suriname for a long time due to their border with the overseas territory of French Guiana. Nonetheless, the European country they probably have the closest ties to would probably be the Netherlands. As one of the three countries of the Dutch language union that South Africa and Namibia refused to join despite speaking Afrikaans, they are closely tied both linguistically and relationally. Many people from each country has family in the other. They visit and study abroad in each other's nations, but mostly Surinamese to the Netherlands, and much of their economy comes from the Dutch, and overall they get each other. Indonesia, India, and China are kind of like the distant ancestors saying, hey, diaspora, we still love you and want you to hold on to your roots. Each of these countries also has an embassy in Parimaribo, which offer community classes in everything from language, music, cooking, and traditional dance, all to encourage the Indo, Javan, and Chinese Surinamese community to keep in touch with their roots. Nonetheless, their closest inner core group of friends would have to be the Caribbean nations, as they are a member of CARICOM. It depends on who you ask, huh. but many Surinamese people I have talked to have said, within the Caribbean, Guyana and Trinidad are very close. All three have very similar backstories and demographical makeups, including Indian and African diaspora communities. Each one has at some point dealt with the same struggles and obstacles that led to their independence. They love each other's music, food, many intermarry between these three, and they overall understand each other pretty well. Nonetheless, if we want to get really technical, the Dutch Antilles would probably be the closest friends they have, specifically the ABC Islands, the constituent countries of Aruba, Bonaire, and Curacao, although wow. technically part of the Netherlands. These three islands have the closest connection to Suriname. Obviously, as Dutch-speaking entities, not only do they relate linguistically, but they share a deep cultural bond and even usually act as hubs for most international flights entering into Suriname. These guys are kind of like the last hanging remnants of anything Dutch-speaking in the Americas, so they kind of have to stick together and support each other. Oh yeah, and also St. Eustatia, St. Martin, and Saba. Jeez, those three are so small and secluded. Can't forget them, though. All right, and in conclusion, you know, I asked some of you guys what you would say to conclude this episode. Here's some of the stuff you guys said. I do really feel this connection with my African heritage, but also with my Asian heritage because my mom is the Creole, my dad is the... Japanese. The nice thing about Suriname is actually that it's still pure and still a lot of rainforest and still a lot of nature and it still has this yeah. easygoing, relaxing like culture. So I'm very well, proud to say that I'm from Suriname. I like watching people's reactions when I tell them that. There is so much racial and religious diversity and I think that's what makes Suriname so very interesting. Um, I think it shows in a way humanity's greatness because I think all the different cultures have their own wisdoms and their own uh, knowledge or views of life uh, cycling home in the cold Dutch weather and all I was thinking about was I want to go home and to just be warm. I'm, I'm grateful to be a Sunamese. With all the blessings as well that, uh, that this country comes with, you know, it's we don't have volcano eruptions or big earthquakes, so that's, that's something to be grateful of. Five different uh, ethnic groups just united as one. It doesn't matter where in the world we go, we will always call Suriname our home. In a way, I guess Suriname really is the hidden emerald gem within the northern part of yeah. South America. And it always kind of maintains its united yet unique fusion identity with grace and pride. Really wish I could have visited this country for this episode. Sorry I couldn't. Maybe sometime after upload I will. But in the meantime, hope you're doing well, Suriname. And with that, stay tuned. Sweden is coming up next. Woohoo, Suriname. Oh, wow. Like, they pretty much said kind of what I was going to kind of say about just being like a chill, peaceful country. Everyone kind of gets along and very proud people. And, yeah, I mean, there's no drama with, you know, uh, there's no wars going on. Like, there's no, I mean, I guess I had the little tips back in the day, but, like, now it, it, it seems peaceful and no conflict at all and everyone just seemed to be having a good time and just doing their thing and kind of going back and forth between the Netherlands and, you know, doing their thing between them and learning and doing cool stuff. <laughs> There's not really much else to say about it, but anyway, it's definitely an awesome country. Uh, and there you have it, guys. Uh, if you guys have anything else to add, please leave in the comments below. Uh, I, like I said, I never heard of this country and glad I do now. I definitely... It's definitely very interesting, especially like the, you know, the connection, you know, with, with you know, the Dutch Netherlands connection. That's just really cool. Uh, I am kind of curious though, because I have heard 
of this country and I, I wouldn't be able to tell you at all like where this was located on the map. I'm just kind of curious. Please don't mad at me. I'm just kind of curious in the comments if, if, if someone's watching this for the first time and it hasn't actually seen the new Geography Now episode uh, what they're, if they're like me and didn't di know. Just kind of curious, you know. But anyways, guys, like and subscribe. I hope you guys continue on this journey and do you Sweden whenever it gets released. Who knows? Probably be in a couple weeks. Could be a month. I don't know. Anyways, guys, we'll continue our journey on geography now. And peace. Catch you guys, excuse me, in future videos. Like and subscribe. And I'm out here. Woo!